What I want to get to this afternoon, probably more towards the back end of it in three or four hours or so, um, is, is um, don't laugh, Janice said it was okay. I mean, <laughs> so, so um, is touching on the subject of altars. There are many different types of altars, some natural, some spiritual. When we look at the Old Testament, I mean, I'm mostly natural, but we do spiritually what they did physically in the Old Testament. So uh, New Testament altars are basically spiritual. A lot of different forms of altars, good altars, bad altars, small altars, big altars, and so on. You can look at altars on a, a micro basis or a macro basis. Uh, as an example, uh, on a micro basis might be a prayer altar that you've developed and established in your own home. On the larger scale, the ecclesia itself stands upon an altar of heaven on earth as a gateway between the heavenly realm and the physical realm uh, so that the heavenly realm operates through the ecclesia which is standing on the heavenly altar on earth to establish the kingdom on earth. So you can kind of go from, this. size doesn't necessarily denote strength, so you know, though you may have a small, as it were, altar at home as a prayer altar, that doesn't mean it's because it's small it lacks strength. I mean, prayer altars and worship altars in people's houses and so on can have tremendous impact and tremendous strength. I want to get to the idea of, of altars on the back end a little bit, but um, we need sort of a process to get there. Uh, so we'll start with the process. The subject itself uh, is pretty extensive and there's absolutely no chance at all in covering it in detail in the next 45 or 50 minutes. So what we'll do is just kind of skim the surface but, but hopefully uh, get the general idea. With um, uh, altars, um, it's a pretty amazing subject actually when you start, start looking at it. But the, the essence of the... Look, to get to altars, the essence of it is simply this. What happens when prayer doesn't work? We've all experienced it, unless I'm the only one. Um, but in my general experience in the last 40 years in ministry and a lot of other ministries, and so on, what, what happens when prayer doesn't work? I mean, what happens when you pray, you believe, you do everything you know how to do, the church is praying, other people are praying, family members are praying, everyone that knows how to pray is praying, and it doesn't work and you still wind up with the worst case outcome. Um, what went wrong? What happened? I think I would pretty much guarantee we've all been there, one way or another, in one form or another. Let, let me sort of give you some examples, and I, I've looked at a lot of... You know, I've understood it more in the last few months, but I've been looking at it for years and going, why? Just after I was saved about 40 years ago, um, very first visiting ministry I ever met in a church was a Puerto Rican guy. And uh, I was with the pastor of the church and, and this Puerto Rican guy was talking about some, minister, uh, some ministry meetings he'd done in South Africa. And he's talking about these people who got out of wheelchairs. And they're saying, yeah, there was five people there that night in this particular meeting in wheelchairs, and he prayed for all five of them, and three of them got out, and, you know, they were dancing and rejoicing and whatever the case may be. Now, whether I'm a glass half-empty guy instead of half-full or whatever, but my heart immediately went out to the two that didn't. Because, I, I mean, imagine for a moment, if you would, uh, God forbid, but, you know, you're in a wheelchair, and there's five wheelchairs along here, and let's say you're number three. Bang, first one gets out, yahoo, jumping joyfully, praising God. Bang, number two is out, get to you number three, nothing happens. Number four, wow, straight out, hang on, what, what went wrong there? One on either side got out of their wheelchair, dancing, rejoicing, and you're sitting there. And number five is left sitting there. It's like, what? Does God not love me? Not care about me? rejected me I mean my heart went out thinking like those two that saw three get out besides them and they got nothing at face value what were they thinking on the way home from that meeting that night what torment emotionally spiritually physically what I mean what were they going through 
Now, we've all sort of heard the stories that somebody got prayer, nothing happened then, and then five days later they got a magnificent result or whatever. So discounting that for a moment, at face value, nothing happened. Now, I said to this Puerto Rican guy, I said, well, what about the two that didn't? And he said, oh, I was too busy rejoicing for the three that did. Well, okay, well, whatever. I mean, I'd only been saved about six months at the time, so I didn't know any better. Over the years, in, in a lot of meetings, a lot of different countries and different circumstances and so on, i prayed for people in prayer lines. I've seen some get magnificently, miraculously, amazingly healed or set free or whatever. I've seen some in the same prayer line that kind of got some improvement, something kind of happened, I'm not quite sure how much or what, and then a whole bunch of other people that at face value prayed and they pretty much went home with exactly the same condition that they arrived in. Yeah, what, what's, what's that all about? I, I really feel for, the, for the, those that you know, kind of go home with the same condition. If you've got a Bible with you, if we open up to uh, Second uh, Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, or four, 3 and 4. This is, this is kind of almost the gospel to some degree uh, contained in two verses. So according as his divine power, he has given us all things, not some things or a few things, but he has given us all things. Tense is important. He has given, not he will give. So it's already done, already been done. He has given us all things, not a few things or some things, already done, already given us everything that we could possibly need that pertain to physical life and spiritual life, or life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us uh, exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers. I love the way the Passion Translation puts it. In the Passion Translation it says that we might partner in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That last bit, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, you can filter through Colossians 1.13 where it says he has transferred, translated us out from underneath the authority of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So what it really means, and it's using the word escape there and then if we sort of do it through the lens of Colossians 1.13, it simply means when you are born again, you have been instantly removed from the jurisdictional authority of the powers of darkness. You are no longer operating under the jurisdictional power of the authority of darkness. The authority or the power of darkness has and can exercise no authority over you whatsoever, unless you give it to them, by your words, by your actions, whatever the case may be. And, and that's mostly what happens, though it might be inadvertent, but it is ultimately mostly what happens. Well, have a look at it with all this. But you have escaped the authority and the, the powers of darkness, you are no longer under their jurisdictional authority. Now, there's, there's kind of some conditions built into this. It's not under law, it's under grace. But, um, okay, so he's given us all things uh, that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. So, you know, you do need to have some sort of knowledge about Jesus and what he's done and what the cross is about. If you don't have that basic knowledge, you, you probably you're going to run into a few issues. Uh, given exceedingly precious promises that by these you can partner in the divine nature. Well, if you don't understand the promises, you know, again, you're probably going to have a little bit of a problem here and there. But based on those two verses, the church or the ecclesia should be the most astonishing, amazing, mind-snapping place on the planet because everyone should be walking in perfect health. Everyone should be walking in peace and shalom. Everyone should be in well-being. I mean, they may encounter some challenges, but the, the one who brings the challenges, uh, you are no longer under their jurisdictional authority. So the, the church, based on those two verses, and assuming you know, the, the basic knowledge of Jesus and the promises, should be the most mind-snapping place on earth. The unbelievers should be looking at what's happening in the church and should be lined up at the door around the block to get in because this is the place 
that everyone gets healed. This is the place that they're all prosperous. This is the place where they're all at peace and well-being and yeah, everything's great. I mean, they, they lack for no good thing. Oddly enough, though, I mean, it's probably been my general experience around the world that that's not quite the way it works. Uh, in fact, by and large, you know, they're not lined up at the door and the general uh, world's view of the church is not necessarily all that, that good. Occasionally, though, there are some great stories and some miraculous stories that we hear. A church that I've been attending for the last few months up at, uh, in, in Toowoomba, there's one of the pastors there uh, who about three and a half years ago was diagnosed with a very aggressive cancer and the particular cancer, uh, once you're diagnosed, you've normally got a maximum of about 18 months, a couple of years to live. Now, he stepped back from ministry and just began to engage in battle with this thing. He eventually, as he went through this process, and I've heard a lot of his testimony, everything got stripped away until he had nothing but God himself. Mm -hmm. So he started, of course, praying for healing, seeking for healing, believing for healing, and so on. And eventually he got down to a point where he didn't care about healing. All he wanted was God himself. Everything else was stripped away. And that became the turnaround. And today uh, he's back preaching. He's done two or three meetings since I've been there. And uh, he's completely healed. I mean, three years ago, uh, he was given 18 months, two years to live. So he's doing fairly well today. And he's back in full-time ministry and he's back preaching and completely healed. So here and there you do see some occasional um, miraculous outcomes. But sadly, generally speaking, those are the exception, not, not the norm. I mean, many times in churches, you know, the divorce rate's pretty much the same, give or take, as it is in the world. Uh, people dying of, of um, chronic diseases and experiencing chronic pain and lack and problems or whatever is often not hugely different in the statistics in the church to outside the church. Why is that? There's a few different answers, and I mean, you can unpack them and spend a lot of time with each one, but uh, one of them is faith. Um, in Matthew 29, um, Jesus is dealing with two blind men, and uh, he says to them, be it done unto you according to your faith. So faith obviously has, has a bearing. Another one is our words. I've seen many times, and I've, I've been guilty of it myself, where we've prayed and believed for something or had somebody else pray for us, and then the next day or two days later, what's coming out of our mouth uh, is probably undermining what, what we were believing for two days before. You know, in uh, Proverbs 18, um, 20, I think it says, uh, you know, a man's stomach will be filled with the fruit of his mouth. Um, uh, he will be satisfied, I think the one version says, with the harvest of his lips. It's a nice King James way of saying, hey, you know what? You're going to live with the consequences of what comes out of your mouth. Um, you're going to create your own reality with whatever comes out of your mouth. So we can pray and have faith and believe by faith, but we've got to be careful that we then don't uh, white ant that or, or diminish it by what's coming out. And, and I mean, I've seen that happen many times and to be honest, being guilty of it myself. So we, we can have a lack of results. Sometimes it's a question of faith. Sometimes we've inadvertently white-handed it by what's coming out of our own mouth. One definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. So sometimes if we're not getting the results, we need to look at a third option, which is strategies. You know, you can bind and break and loose and rebuke and pray and whatever all you like, but I mean, you know, if it's not getting the result, um, then praying pretty much the same way the fifth time and hoping that maybe God hears you the fifth time and when he ignored you the previous four times um, and, and somehow if, if God just hears, hears your desperate cry five times, <laughs> though he ignored you for the previous four, the fifth time he's going, oh, all right, look, anything to shut you up. Yeah. Um, maybe if it doesn't work five times, let, let's keep going the 17th time you prayed the same prayer, maybe that'll work, or the 27th time. No, nah, probably not. So sometimes it can be strategies. So faith, words are important, strategies. 
David in uh, the Valley of Rephaim in 1 Chronicles chapter 14, the Philistines are coming against him. He prays. God says, yep, go out against them. I'll give them into your hand. They, he wins a great victory. They come back. And David prays again, not believing that last week's strategy will necessarily work this week. God gives him a fresh strategy. He employs that fresh strategy, has a massive victory, and the fear of him goes out all around the land and so on. So sometimes what we need to do is say, OK, Lord, we've tried the basic prayer and we've checked our faith and we've made sure that what's coming out of our mouth is OK. But is this something that I need a prayer strategy for victory? Do I need to be like David and do I need a specific strategy to deal with this particular problem? And in dealing with the problem, last week's strategy is not necessarily going to work for this week's strategy. The strategy is important. Sometimes we've got to be aware of cause and effect. And cause and effect can take us into a whole bunch of areas. But cause and effect... Um, David in First Chronicles, um, First Chronicles 14 in, in the Valley of Rephaim, he not only goes after them and strikes them with the edge of the sword, but when they run in defeat, he burn, it says there he burnt their gods. So he's dealing with not only a natural problem, but he's dealing with a spiritual root cause. Another good example of it is Jesus in the Sea of Galilee with the storm in the boat. They're on the way to the Gadarenes, massive storm comes up, and Jesus speaks to the waves, but rebukes the wind. So in other words, the waves are, the waves are being caused by the wind. It's cause and effect. So you can speak into the effect, you can speak into the problem, but you may need to rebuke a root cause. And I've seen many times where you know, results are pretty limited, where people just keep speaking in, into the, the effect. They just keep praying against the symptoms. They just keep praying against the problem. And the problem basically is not going away. So it's probably time at that point to either, well, assuming you've checked faith, assuming you've checked what's coming out of your mouth, assuming you have checked and asked about strategy, then it might be time to look at cause and effect. Instead of just praying about the outcome, we need to deal with a greater root cause, like the wind and the waves. What am I dealing with here, Lord? What's actually causing? What's the root cause of this that I need to deal with? One kind of example of that at the moment, for whatever it's worth, is what's happening in Gaza. You know, there's a massive problem on the ground in Gaza with a lot of people suffering. And, and you can... Throw rockets and bombs at it all you like. And, you know. But at the end of the day, the root cause is spiritual. So no matter how much you try to deal with it on the ground, until the root cause, which is uh, you know, just a spiritual hatred of the very existence of Israel, until that spiritual root cause is dealt with, uh, even if the situation in Gaza gets resolved this time, there'll, there'll be another one and another one and another one because... You know, you've got, got an undealt with unresolved root cause, which is just a hatred of, of Israel's very existence. One of the slightly more complex cause and effect and problems are, uh, can come down to the issue of altars. But John 10.10 10, says that Jesus came to, that you might have life and have it more abundantly, and the thief came not but to steal, kill and destroy. So we've got an idea of how Jesus came to give life and give it abundantly. We've just read this scripture in, uh, in Peter. The thief came to steal, kill and destroy. What might that look like in real terms? How does it work? How is it applied? In, let me find the scripture for you. We won't bother turning there for the sake of time, but you might want to make a note of it. First Peter, 
5.18. And it speaks about your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. The word devour there comes from a root word meaning to destroy. And the devil is painted there as a violent, merciless predator. Though the, the lion is used, it's certainly in no relation to the lion of Judah. It's presented as a violent, merciless predator who goes about looking, looking for an opportunity to see who it is that he might be able to destroy. Looking around, looking for an opportunity. Who can I destroy? Destroy them physically with sickness, rob them of their destiny, rob them of their purpose, destroy their spiritual walk, whatever. I'm looking for an opportunity to who I might destroy. How does he do that? The adversary there, as you're probably aware of, comes from a Greek word meaning, or the Greek word is antidikos. It means opponent at law. So what he is, is essentially a prosecutor in a court of law. In Revelation 12.10, it talks about the one who was cast down, the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before the throne of God night and day. The word there is categorio, which means one who accuses in a court of law before a judge. In other words, he's the anti dekos he's your opponent at law who accuses you before God the judge. And bear in mind, the accusation that he makes must carry weight and legitimacy, otherwise what's the point? I mean, seriously, I mean, if he's going in there accusing you of something that has no weight and no legitimacy, I mean, get out. Why are we even listening to you? So he's looking for an opportunity, going about looking and searching for the one who he can take advantage of and accuse them of something before the throne of God that carries weight and legitimacy, that gives him the opportunity to attack in whatever area it happens to be in. Be, sorry? I'm sorry. Well, I'm thinking the word opportunity, it's like the access. Yes, that is, that's what it is. Look, looking, for the, looking for the point of access, looking for the door of opportunity or the point of access. Why? Because back in Colossians 1.13, it says you have been transferred or translated out. It says there that in the King James, at least anyway, the power, uh, which is better translated as authority, um, because the word there is exousia, not dunamis. So you have been translated, you've, you've been removed from the jurisdictional authority of darkness and placed under the jurisdictional authority of the kingdom of heaven. So he has no jurisdictional authority over you, whatever. None. Zero. Nada. Zip. Unless. Unless by what's coming out of your mouth or your lifestyle, or the way you're acting, you can say, aha, now this one, that one, whatever, I can accuse before the throne of God and say, look at what they are doing, look at what they are saying, look at their lifestyle, I am prosecuting them on the basis of that before the courts, and it gives me legal jurisdictional right to attack them in that area. Not a particularly happy thought, <laughs> but it's a reality nevertheless. Because unless he has, unless he's been given legal authority as the accuser, as the prosecutor, the one who accuses before the judge, he has no jurisdictional authority other than what we ourselves ultimately give him. So the accusation must be legitimate and it must carry weight. Otherwise, what's the point? If you turn over to Matthew 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 23. I was talking about this to someone before we started. So Matthew 25, sorry, Matthew 5, 
verse 23 through to verse 26. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and you remember there that uh, your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. Leave it. Don't, don't try and bring your gift to the altar and present it to God. Leave it at the altar and go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly. And in 40 years I've never actually heard this preached, but anyway. Agree with your adversary quickly. And the word adversary there is exactly the same, anti decos Agree with your opponent, your accuser at law, your prosecutor, quickly, while you're on the way with him, lest at any time the adversary, the anti decos the same one, delivers you to the judge and the judge to the officer and he be cast into prison. For very well, truly, I say to you, you won't by any means get out of there until you've paid the uttermost farthing. Now, here's kind of a crazy thing. Those words are being spoken to believers. So here's this accuser, this anti decos your opponent at law, who accuses you before the great judge night and day, can only accuse you of something that is legitimate and carries power and carries legal weight. And if he does that and you don't deal with it, you may well wind up in prison because that is his purpose. All prosecutors are looking for a sentence to be executed against you. That's the nature of the prosecutor. The prosecutor who accuses you is looking for an opportunity to drag you into court and to execute a sentence against you, just like you see there. What sort of prison? Apparently, apparently as a believer, this anti decos can ultimately have you in prison. A prison of depression, a prison of sickness, a prison of lack, many different forms of prison. And when you look around in the church, locally, globally, wherever, you find that's exactly what's happening. People wind up with chronic health problems, chronic unresolved health problems. People in business can, can be in a situation where they're gaining momentum, they're doing well, everything's going well, and it just falls over. And they pick themselves up, dust themselves off, go again, gain momentum, success, 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 <laughs> fell over. And this is just a repeating cycle for no apparent reason, but they're just in this cycle of prison, a prison of sickness, a prison of depression. You go through some families, Christian families, certainly families outside the church, where, I mean, every extended family these days has probably had somebody touched by cancer because cancer is so prevalent. But you find in some families, generationally, women in their 30s and 40s are dying of breast cancer. And it's just like a statistic way above a normal statistic, and it's a generational issue. They're in prison. That, that family's in that prison. Men, young men in the families dying of heart attacks. Um, you know, violence, alcoholism, addiction, whatever. And you find these patterns that are chronic, repeating patterns, whether it be lack, business failure, divorce, sickness, whatever, they're in that prison. They've been taken to court. They have been accused and prosecuted and put in prison. I was there myself. Been a few years now, thank God, <laughs> or a few years out of it, thank God. But been there myself, worn the T-shirt, and, and this is going back like 20 plus years ago, and, and it was in business. And Barb and I just went through this cycle. I mean, 
we would have money, things would be going well, and we'd be going, wow, this is it. We've finally broken through, and you could guarantee six or eight months later, we'd be back struggling and like everything had fallen over and we would pick ourselves up, you know, we're not going to do that again. And we'd pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, we'd gain momentum, things are going well, 18 months later we'd be having the same con conversation again. Um, in Barb's family, uh, which, which were all in Sydney, uh, there were patterns within that family. But I'm sure we've all either, if we haven't experienced it personally, we know families and know people who've had those repeating cycles. So what do you do with that? I mean, how do you get out of the prison? Well, all things being equal, in past, in past times, um, we probably would have referred to altars and used the word stronghold instead, uh, but essentially it's an altar. Here's the thing. Going back to Genesis, in Genesis 1, God spoke to Adam and Eve and, and it gave them absolute dominion on earth. So only flesh and blood had authority on earth. No demon, no angel, no spiritual entity, even God himself stepped back and delegated authority on earth to flesh and blood and did not override uh, his own word or authority. The scripture also says in Psalm uh, 115, the heavens, the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he gave to the children of men. Now because flesh and blood has authority on earth, spiritual entities don't have legal authority. For a spiritual authority or a spiritual entity to operate on earth, it needs to operate through the realm of an altar. Good altars, bad altars. Now, to give you an example, how many of you got a smartphone? Everyone? Okay. You got apps on your smartphone? Okay. Here's what an app is. It's an interface on your phone between you and the company that owns it. And by virtue of that interface, you do business with that company. You do your banking, you withdraw money, you, you transfer money, pay your bills, whatever. In other words, that is an electronic interface between you and the company that owns the interface by which you conduct business exchange and so on. It's an electronic altar, basically. An altar is firstly and mostly an interface between the physical and the spiritual realm, by which you conduct business with the spiritual realm and the spiritual realm conducts business with you. It is firstly and foremostly an interface. Turn over to, um, go to Genesis, let's find it, say Genesis 12. Genesis 12 uh, and verse, uh, verse, uh, uh, be nice if I wrote the right verse down, wouldn't it? And also be nice if I actually got out of Exodus and went to Genesis. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like the milk bottle out in the kitchen. I was trying to make a cup of coffee and I said, this thing works a lot better when you take the lid off. Um, okay, so Genesis, we're in 12, and uh, we'll go to verse, uh, verse 8, or well, verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said unto thy seed, I will give this land. And he builded an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he moved from thence to the mountains uh, on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and uh, high, on, hey, high on, on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Go over to verse, uh, or go over to Genesis 28. And in Genesis 28, let's look at about 16 to 19. And Jacob waked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. It's basically the same place 
and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other than the house of God, for this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put uh, for his pillows and set up a pillar and poured oil upon it. And he called the place Bethel. But the name of that city was uh, called Luz at first. An altar is a gateway. It is an interface. Uh, it is a place of power. Um, it is a place of exchange. There are good altars, bad altars. One, one, it, altars take many different forms. It's not, you know, we, particularly any of us who came from a Catholic or Anglican background, we're used to the, you know, the seats in the church and the priest officiating up at an altar. Uh, there is actually a great truth in that a priest does officiate at an altar, but, you know, the doctrine might go a bit wonky uh, in some of those uh, churches. But the altar uh, is the place that we officiate at. Good altars and bad altars, different forms of altars. The greatest altar that, that ever appeared on earth was the cross. It's an altar is a place of sacrifice. It's an interface between the spiritual realm and the physical realm. It's a place of power. And it's a place of exchange. So the cross was a place of sacrifice, it was a place of interface, it was a place of power, and it was a place of exchange, where he took our sin, we got his righteousness, and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. But in the Old Testament, there we see a lot of altars, mostly physical altars, mostly physical. We've just seen with Abraham and, and Jacob there. Many different altars, good altars, bad altars. Altars to the living God, altars to Baal, Asherah, Moloch, and, and any number of bad altars as well. Now within that context, we then read through the history of Israel, and there are bad kings who built altars to foreign gods, and the nation ultimately wore the consequences. There are good kings who destroyed the altars to foreign gods, and then there are relatively mediocre kings who just didn't do anything much one way or the other. They sort of re-established the worship to God, but tolerated the foreign altars. That was the nature of history in Israel, and they ultimately paid the consequence. What will the church be in this generation? Good king or bad king? Because we are called as kings and priests. What will we do about the altars in the land? I mean, in Israel, through history, there are foreign altars and altars to foreign gods that cause great havoc in the nation. Yeah. But what they did physically, we do spiritually. And we are the spiritual kings and priests. So is it possible, possible, that the reason there is such havoc in our nations, and take it around the nations of the world, is because the ecclesia as the kings and priests are acting like relatively mediocre kings and priests, and they are establishing worship to God, but are not seriously dealing with the altars that have been established in the land and polluting the land. I mean, we don't go out hacking things down, breaking things down these days, but we do need to deal with it spiritually. And a good example of it is Gideon. Now, Gideon was incredibly insecure, incredibly doubtful, um, didn't really think too much of himself. When the angel of the Lord appeared to him, he immediately started complaining, well, you know, if God's really with us, how come we've got all these problems or whatever? or well, possibly an indicator of the problem. Yeah. Hey, he was a guy, you know. I mean, I know if he's a woman, it would have been a whole lot of different stuff here. <laughs> but look, he was a guy, right? <laughs> he was a dude, so he's doing his best. <laughs> so, so 
I mean, bearing in mind when Gideon has sort of taken the approach, well, you know, God's really with us. Why have we got all these problems? The fact that his father was probably the priest of the foreign god whose altar was in their backyard or whatever, that could have been a reasonable indicator. But you know, then he's told, look, go cut these altars down, destroy these altars. Not only do you need to destroy these altars, but then you need to sacrifice a burnt offering and re-establish the proper uh, worship to the living God. So we know the great victory that was won with these 300 against you know, 100,000 Midianites or whatever. But that entire physical victory was hinged on and contingent upon the destruction of the altars and the re-establishing of the burnt offering to God. In other words, it was cause and effect. Let's deal with the root cause, then we can go and deal with the effect. So we're talking a lot about physical altars. Today, um, we deal with spiritual altars. In the proper godly sense, I mean, we said before, the ecclesia as a whole stands upon an altar of heaven on earth by which there is an exchange and a pathway and a gate for heaven to do business on earth. But equally, uh, around the world today, there are massive altars in nations to demonic powers and worship. I mean, it, altars are not as obvious as the, as the you know, Catholic Anglican altar up the front of the church. In Israel's day, they had an altar to Moloch that they used to sacrifice their children on. In that day, in that demonic altar, there were probably thousands, maybe tens of thousands of children sacrificed over the years on that altar. So where's the altar today? Well, as a general indicator, since Roe versus Wade came into being in the US, there has been something like 61 million abortions. It's the same God. It's the same demon. It's just a spiritual altar, different face on, but it's the same God. So we deal in the New Testament with spiritual altars. They can be, gen and, and I mean, that's national, but let's kind of bring this to an end and look at it more personally. Altars can be established either nationally, be it Roe versus Wade, be it whatever else. There's a great book by a guy called Jonathan Kahn called Return of the Gods. I recommend to anyone to grab it and uh, read it. So we get out of the kind of national realm into the personal realm. So we come back to families who have these chronic reoccurring problems. So altars have been established in that, that family, either generationally or personally. Altars can be established through trauma and our reaction to that. Um, through soul wounds. What do I mean by soul wound? Okay. Let's say somebody does something to you that is very unjust, that is very hurtful, very traumatising, and it causes a wound, a wounding in your soul. You begin to dwell on that. You begin to kind of talk a lot about that wound and how much it hurt, you begin to withhold quite a bit of anger and bitterness about that, there is an altar of bitterness established in your soul based upon that soul wound. Altars get established from soul wounds. From trauma, depending on your reaction and response to trauma, Transgression and iniquity establish soul altars. So it can be our own personal stuff, 
And, and I'm thinking of a kind of a friend of a friend of a friend I know in Toowoomba who is actually a Christian but is currently uh, living a lifestyle that is quite non-Christian and with full knowledge and awareness that that lifestyle is entirely non-biblical. That is going to produce altars in that person's life. Because transgression, which is living in rebellion, basically, mm -hmm. that will open a portal. And what actually happens, a portal is opened by the transgression or by the soul wound and the way we react to it. A portal is opened. There is a demon there at that portal motivating the bitterness or the lifestyle or whatever's going on. We come into agreement with that. If we do, we come into agreement with it. And when we come into agreement with it, we legitimise it and give it strength and authority. There is then an altar established. The demon is on the altar at the portal and it controls that portal and what comes through it and there's nothing good coming through it. And you can then have that portal, open portal, with that altar and that demon on it, operating generationally. Hence what you get is chronic sickness through generations, chronic lack through generations, chronic violence through generations, and all sorts of repeating patterns. Altars can have tremendous impact and power. All demons or idols on the altar, all demand worship and they all demand sacrifice. Often the worship is in the form of you coming into agreement with it and the sacrifice is ultimately your life or your well-being or your financial whatever. Back from uh, Genesis 28. When we were <laughs> altars, can have altars can have tremendous impact in our life. So an altar can be established out of trauma, yeah, trauma soul wound. Soul wound. Yeah. Uh, and, and altars have demons on them, or idols are demons, yeah. basically, same thing. Just, just, just say, and the idol demands worship and sacrifice. Okay, thank you. Altars are a place of worship and sacrifice. So le let me give you kind of an example here. A family who has a generational history of cancer. Somebody says, well, you know, all the women in our family die of breast cancer in their 30s or 40s. You've just come into agreement with it You've legitimised it and given it authority. You've worshipped it. Then the sacrifice is the death. So th this becomes incredibly important what comes out of our mouth. Because if you're dealing with a sickness, and you know many of us do, in different ways at different times. And I am speaking more about, you know, chronic generational issues, not if you, you got a cold last week for a few days or whatever. But what we need to do is say, okay, here's this pattern, but it stops here. Because I am no longer coming into agreement with it. In fact, I am rebuking it and will not tolerate it and will not come into agreement with it. And what we have is a, is a magnificent promise through the, through, through the throne of grace as a believer. This is the place, that we, the highest place in the universe that we come for grace and help in the time of need. Where we come and repent of whatever family or generational thing or you know, whatever it may be, and the Lord may well give you some clear insight as to what happened, how it happened, and where this thing began, or he may not. It doesn't matter greatly that much. But it is the place that you come 
and say, here's this anti-DCOS, this prosecutor that is prosecuting me or my family on the basis of a covenant, on the basis of a soul wound that I didn't really resolve or whatever it is, he is prosecuting me and there's this repeating cycle because I'm in prison. What do I need to do? Well, I need to probably come into agreement with the anti dikos and I need to go before the throne of grace and say, Lord, here I am. I'm guilty. I agree with the charge of the anti dikos But Lord... I have my advocate with me, the Holy Spirit, and I surrender all rights of self-representation because I have the representative for me who is the one who is the mediator of the new covenant. And I come into court against this thing that is prosecuting me with my advocate, uh, represented by the mediator of the new covenant, and my claim to justification freedom is his blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how you can deal with it. But going back before, you know, continuing to pray and pray continually and just believe that somehow it's going to change things mm. ain't necessarily so. Mm. Sometimes you've got to recognise and say, okay, this is a repeating, reoccurring cycle. If it's a repeating, reoccurring cycle that he is not responding to normal prayer, then it fundamentally means that the devil has somehow been given legitimate authority to prosecute you under those terms. Now, it's either some unresolved soul, soul wound that you didn't respond to or react to the right way, some trauma, some lifestyle issue, and I'm sure that's not the case here, but, or, some life, or, or some generational issue. But if you yourself are dealing with something that just keeps reoccurring and troubling you, then you need to come before the throne of grace and eliminate... The legitimate cause for it because that's what's got you in prison whether it's a prison of reoccurring depression whether it's a prison of reoccurring lack whether it's a prison of reoccurring chronic health issues whatever it happens to be there is an escape from the prison because you have got a judge you have got and I think you know, it was, who were Kevin Zadai, we were doing that book going back 12, 18 months ago, it's rigged in your favour. Absolutely, totally rigged in your favour. Because you do have a place of grace and a place to come to where you have the mediator of the new covenant and his blood yeah, to justify you and set you free. I was this afternoon going to um, kind of do a bit of a thing on uh, on um, I'm going to say prayer of activation and I had intended to do that all week but in the last couple of days I have sort of felt to just maybe not go there uh, so I would say two things I'll stick around for a while if anyone wants some prayer. And the reason I felt not to go there with a general sort of prayer of activation is because maybe somebody is dealing with some issue that's fairly personal uh, to them and you know don't necessarily want to do some sort of general prayer of activation. Uh, and the other side of it is uh, if you so want to, um, and you are dealing with some sort of reoccurring issue, then you might want to make an appointment to see Suzette and go through the courts or whatever the case may be. Uh, so I sort of felt to leave it alone in a general sense this afternoon. But having said that, um, I will um, stick around for a while. So if anyone particularly wants prayer uh, privately, I'm, I'm quite happy to pray for you. 
But I, it, it's an area that, look, we, we've only barely skimmed the surface of it. But it's something that I've looked at for years when I prayed for people and there's been no result. Now, sometimes it's a timing issue. I prayed for people that appeared to get no result at the time and I've only heard that like five days or two weeks later, you know, they were miraculously, wonderfully healed. So sometimes it can be a time issue. Sometimes it can be a faith issue. Sometimes it can be, you know, what's coming out of your mouth? Are you undermining your own faith by what's coming out of your mouth because your words do have significant power? Or maybe do you just need a different prayer strategy? Uh, or maybe do you need to deal with cause and effect? Uh, there's an underlying root cause of the problem you try to deal with, and, and these are the things that you deal with when it seems that prayer is just not working. But as an extension of cause and effect, you've got to look at the aspects of altars. Mm. Altars can be established. Old Testament, stone, wood, whatever the case may be. Good altars, bad altars, good kings, bad kings. Um, but the altars to foreign gods that were causing problems in the nation were intended to be absolutely demolished. And when this happens spiritually, what happens is that the altar is demolished, but this kind of comes back to a cause and effect issue. You can demolish the altar, but if you don't deal with the idol or the demon and shut the portal, in a relatively short time, you're going to have another problem. So part of the process is we will demolish this altar, we will get rid of the demon, and the idol on the altar, because all altars have an idol on them, or all ungodly altars, and we will get rid of the demon and we'll close the portal. That way you get permanent, permanent relief from it. So many times we need to deal with cause and effect. That cause and effect might simply be binding, breaking, loosing, whatever the case may be, because we've got to deal with it spiritually as well as physically. Uh, but sometimes it goes deeper than that. But there is still an answer. No matter how deep it is, there is still an answer before the throne of grace in the courts of heaven. And there is still an answer with the Holy Spirit as your advocate and the one representing you in the court, the mediator of the new covenant. Uh, and by his blood, you are completely set free.